We're with Kenneth Wright, Executive Director of the Mare Island Historic Park Foundation, and he would like to discuss the history of St. Peter's Chapel. <laughs> Hello. Mare Island Historic Park Foundation is on the site of the former Mare Island Naval Shipyard in Vallejo, California. Of the hundreds of buildings that are on the island, probably one of the most significant is St. Peter's Chapel. Um, it has the distinction of being the oldest naval chapel in the United States. And I have to, I have to add a, con, a caveat to that, and that is that there was another earlier built naval chapel at Annapolis. Um, that chapel was torn down at some point prior to this one being built and is no longer in existence. So I guess the thing we need to say is this is the oldest existing naval chapel in the United States. It was not the first naval chapel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Prior to 1901, when the chapel was built, the services were held in different locations around the island. Sometimes they were held on the USS Independence, which was a receiving ship that was permanently docked at Mare Island. Um, sometimes services were held in Building 47, which was the administration building. Um, there was a courtroom in that building uh, that they used as the Sunday chapel at times. Other times, services were held in the marine barracks, which are visible from here outside the chapel. And other times they were held in the prison, um, which called Old 84, which was controlled by the Marines and was actually a, a prison for the worst of the worst um, in the Pacific Fleet. So the chaplain at the time that this was built was named Adam Armstrong McAllister and he objected to having services in a courtroom or in a prison and really, really wanted to have a building dedicated as a chapel on the island. And so there was a United States Senator named George Perkins, who was an occasional parishioner of, of McAllister's services. And Reverend McAllister enlisted the help of Senator Perkins in obtaining a $5,000 appropriation from Congress through the Department of the Navy to build a naval chapel on Mare Island. A San Francisco architect named Albert Sutton was paid $50 to draw up the plans for the chapel. And the original chapel, as Sutton envisioned it, was a cruciform building with transepts on the sides. The plans were submitted to the Department of, Department of the Navy and they decided that that design was perhaps a little bit too grand for what they were looking for. And so they changed the plans to just entail a rectangular building that was eventually built. Um, let's go inside and take a look. One of the most notable aspects of St. Peter's Chapel is its stained glass. There are 29 stained glass windows in the chapel, 25 of which are Tiffany. Um, this is not Tiffany the jewelry store. Um, this is actually Charles Tiffany's son, Louis Comfort Tiffany, who instead of joining his father in the jewelry business, ventured out on his own and started Tiffany Studios, which was a stained glass works and became the preeminent best known um, maker of stained glass in the United States at that time. Um, the window that we're looking at right now is actually one of, what's well, actually three of the windows which are not Tiffany glass. Um, this was done in San Francisco and it was done in 1906. It was completed in 1906, which as anyone from this area knows was the San Francisco earthquake. And so the original window 
was not damaged in the earthquake, but they were afraid of aftershocks. And so they crated up all three windows and moved them outside of the city to an area which promptly burned to the ground and destroyed the three windows. Mm -hmm. So the design is actually different from the original window, and we're not quite sure why that is. Um, the original design showed a winged victory with her, her arms extended on the prow of a ship going through the Golden Gate. And it said, in God we trust, and had the seal of the United States on it. So there was, there's actually one available picture of that window. And frankly, I think we got the better deal here with this. It was not a particularly attractive window. And this certainly catches the light and is the focal point, I guess, of the chapel as you first enter it. We, we don't quite know why, since Tiffany was still in business in 1906, why this was selected to be crafted in San Francisco rather than New York. And it's been suggested that since this window um, was donated by the native sons of the Golden West, it may have been a function of, well, we're not having a window made in New York when we could have one made in the Golden West Coast. So let's look at some of the other windows. One of the interesting architectural elements of this building is the ceiling um, and the trusses that hold up the roof. If you remember that this was a naval shipyard, and look at the roof, it's easy to imagine that it's the inverted hull of a wooden ship. Um, the other interesting thing about the interior of this building is that almost everything was crafted by the woodworkers that were on the island. And that includes not the woodworkers, but the metal shop. Um, all of the nuts and bolts that you see were cast here and used in the chapel. Um, the pews were all handcrafted and hand carved in the wood shop, as was the altar and all of the furniture and the paneling that you're looking at right now towards the front of the building. One of the interesting things about Tiffany and their company was they did business a little bit differently than other stained glass makers at the time. Most stained glass makers just bought clear glass and they painted the texture or the color into the glass. Tiffany had their own glass making studio and as a result they had glass that was different textures, different colors, and the color was all actually molten into the glass. Um, and as a result, when you ordered a Tiffany window, and that's something that's kind of interesting too, a lot of people imagine that these windows were all custom made for this chapel. And in fact, they came out of a catalog. Tiffany had a catalog um, and you just went through it and you picked out the window and the size that you wanted and then their people would make it according to what your specifications were for that um, application. Um, they did get to a point eventually where they started only producing two of the same windows. So we're not sure if any of these windows are duplicated in facilities that have Tiffany windows elsewhere. Um, another interesting fact about Tiffany is is probably visible in these two windows. Um, I stated earlier that 29 there were of the 29 windows in the chapel, 25 were Tiffany, four were not. And this is one of the ones that was not, that is not Tiffany. Um, she's called the Virgin and the Olives, and she's one of the two windows that was installed last um, in the chapel. She was installed in 1930. This is a Tiffany window next to her, and he's called the Shepherd. If you look at the Virgin of the Olives by herself, she's a great depiction of a female holding a child on, on stained glass. But if you compare her to the Tiffany window next door, you'll see that she takes on sort of a two-dimensional aspect where he takes on a three-dimensional aspect. 
Tiffany was famous for only painting the hands, the feet, and the faces of their individuals. So if you look at the detail, the shading on him compared with her, it, it really does sort of illuminate the difference between Tiffany and other stained glass. The other thing is that Tiffany did not paint clear glass, which this is painted. So this glass started out clear and all of this effect was painted onto the glass. Tiffany, on the other hand, used multiple layers of glass. So when a Tiffany window was ordered, the person who was making the glass would actually go into their warehouse and pull out pieces of glass, which when you combine them, would make the effect that they were trying to get on their window. And that's why Tiffany windows were so expensive. These windows, at the time they were installed, cost between four and $600 a piece. Um, and, you know, they are collectively worth much, much more than that at this point. This window probably would have been Tiffany um, at the time, except Tiffany had gone out of business. Stained glass in residences um, had gone out of style by the late 20s. And so Tiffany went out of business, I believe, in 1928. And as a result, this window was made locally in San Francisco as well. St. Peter's looks today similarly to what it looked like when it was first built. Um, one of the notable differences, however, is that the first organ that was installed in St. Peter's was not a pipe organ. So in 1901, this, when this first opened, the altar actually extended up almost to the bottom of the round window. There were no pipes. The organ was still set off to the side where the pipe organ is, but it was a pump organ. And it was a, it was a reed pump organ. And it's, it's interesting in looking at the chaplain's records at the time because they paid some urchin 50 cents a Sunday to stand there and pump the thing while the organist played. And that was a substantial amount of money back then. Um, if you look at the offering records for the chapel, it was not uncommon for the weekly offering to be under 20 cents. So to pay someone 50 cents to pump the organ was kind of a substantial output. And at the time, the largest expense on a weekly basis was for the organist. Um, the other interesting thing about the front of this is the front of the chapel is the crucifix. At, at the time the chapel was opened, it was an interdenominational chapel, but it was very uncommon to have Catholic services here. There was a small Catholic chapel in another building um, for a long time. And once Catholic services started to be added here, they needed both the Protestant and the Catholic cross. And so to alleviate the necessity of having two separate crosses, the cross that's up there now is <clears throat> reversible. And so if there's a Catholic service, it has Christ hanging from the cross. And at times that we have Protestant services, if you flip the cross around, it has IHS, ICTHUS, um, on that, which we use for Protestant services. This eagle lectern is notable because it was actually the first thing donated to the chapel in memory of someone. Um, there was a naval ensign named James Hand who died in the hospital of cancer, and his memorial service was the first memorial service held in the chapel. And after the service, his aunt and his sisters, which are interestingly noted in the record as the Missy's Hand, um, donated this eagle lectern to the chapel. And it used, to be, it used to be much taller because it sat down in the nave. Um, and at some point it was moved up here and, and shortened. And that brings to light an interesting and kind of fun story. If you, if you look back here, the eagle actually has tail feathers which extend beyond the lectern. And at some point, in, I believe, the 60s, there was a rather large chaplain here 
um, who would be delivering his sermon or reading the scriptures, and the tail feathers would be poking him in his stomach, which he objected to. And so the lectern disappeared into storage for a time until the new chaplain arrived. And there's also another story. One of, the, one of the funnest things about my job is getting to meet people who were stationed here or who had family here because they come up with stories which are not recorded anywhere else. And one of those stories concerns this lectern. Um, there was apparently a new base commander um, and the commander would always sit in the first pew in the first seat on the right hand side and so commander was just sort of right in front of the chaplain as they were giving his sermon and the chaplain noticed at the time that there was just sort of a scowl on the commander's face and he couldn't figure out what he was doing apparently what what the problem was and he was a little worried about it and so after the service they were out front and the chaplain was shaking hands with everyone and the commander came up and, and you know, gave him praise and, and said, great service, you know, the music was nice, everything was good, and turned to leave and then turned back and looked at the chaplain and said, but lose the seagull. And so apparently the lectern at that point went into storage until there was a new commander as well. This window is notable for a couple of reasons. Um, this is a Tiffany window, and <clears throat> the thing that distinguishes this from the other windows is the image in this window, which is called the shepherd and his flock, is actually an homage to the founding chaplain, Adam Armstrong McAllister. Um, they paid Tiffany more for this window for them to include the actual image of Chaplain McAllister in the window. Um, the other interesting thing about this window is when Catholic services were started to be held here uh, in the 50s regularly, it necessitated adding rooms on the sides of the building. Um, one side had rooms that were used for confessional. There's a, a, a three-person confessional in one side, and the other side was used for storage of Protestant um, worship items. Um, and this window is one of two which are not directly lit from the sun outside. There are, there are bulbs behind this window since there are rooms behind it now. In the 1920s, a decision was made to remove the old pump reed organ and replace it with a pipe organ. Um, the first pipe organ was installed in 1929, and it was made by Wix, um, which was interestingly a jewelry and watchmaking company in Illinois that had expanded their business into pipe organs, and that company still exists today. This is not the original Wix console. In 1969, upgrades were made to this organ, um, and that included replacing the original Wix console with this Schantz console. Um, this organ, for organ buffs, is an eight-rank um, pipe organ. It's two manuals with a full AGO pedal board, and it's also unified. Um, unified means that you can expand the tonal resources of the instrument without adding pipes. So essentially, the stops could control, multiple stops could control the same rank of pipes either on the same manual or on different manuals. And I won't go into a lot of explanation on that. There's, there's plenty of explanation online. Um, but the organ is kept in tune and is used regularly for weddings and memorial services. And we're very fortunate to have a world-class organ building company in Benicia, Schoenstein and Company. Um, and they've been very generous in helping us to maintain this organ, which um, is not an easy task and certainly is not inexpensive. I'll tell one more sort of interesting story about the stained glass, and that is the fact that when this was built in 1901, none of the stained glass existed. The windows 
all existed, but they were in clear glass. Mm -hmm. And so Chaplain McAllister um, wanted something that looked a little more churchy, I guess. And so there was a company in New Jersey that sold paper that was in the image of stained glass. Mm -hmm. And so Chaplain McAllister, according to the records of the, the chapel, paid $17 for uh, mm -hmm paper that looked like stained glass. And when it arrived here, he paid one of the parishioners $50 to cut out that paper into the shapes of the existing windows so that he would have stained glass um, until the windows were donated later on. Um, it, he also used that same company to put the stained glass over the clear windows in the courtroom in the administration building where he also used to hold services. St. Peter's Chapel is today owned by the city of Vallejo. Um, the city of Vallejo rents it to us, the Mare Island Historic Park Foundation, and we maintain it and also rent it out for funerals, um, weddings, mm -hmm. baptisms, really anything that you want to use it for. Um, it's also, we have uh, musical concerts here. Um, Vallejo Choral Society presents a uh, Christmas concert every year. And there have been in the past organ concerts um, from well-known artists around the world that have played here. Um, you can call the museum, uh, Mare Island Museum, for information on renting the chapel. And if you want more information on the chapel that's a little more detailed than what we did today, um, a, local a local author named Barbara Davis, who is one of our volunteers, wrote sort of the definitive book.